So this is a live recording of a podcast. We'll basically treat it like a public conversation. Um, but since it is also going out to a lot more people on the podcast afterwards, um, it may be that if I get something really wrong, I sort of start to question again. Uh, Camille, <laughs> you should feel free to do that as well. Uh, but we'll basically just treat it as a live conversation and, and see what happens. Um, and uh, uh, normally I introduce uh, guests after I have a conversation, I record uh, the introduction so that uh, we, you know, I can give a little bit of a preview of what we actually talked about. I'm going to do that uh, for the actual podcast too, but just to tell you before we launch into the conversation who Camille is, um, he's one of the co-founders of FreeThink, which is a really interesting uh, website uh, trying to uh, cover the news in a way uh, that escapes the partisan polarization we have in the States at the moment. He's uh, the co-host of a really fun, wonderful, uh, free-reading podcast um, uh, called The Fifth Column. Um, which usually involves a lot of drinking. I think I uh, pleaded <laughs> to a bad headache I had when I was on the podcast and didn't drink anything, but um, everybody else did, which made it all more, all more fun. Um, and, and he's just a really interesting, important thinker in this space. Um, all right, Camille Foster, welcome to the podcast. Yasha, it is always splendid to talk to you, always. It's wonderful to see you. Um, listen, so, um, you know, the whole country for the last weeks seems to have been talking about critical race theory. And mm. you have an interesting, slightly unique position in this, because I take it that you're both a, a critic of critical race theory, but you think especially the way in which some of those concepts are taken and uh, taught in schools is in fact worrisome. Uh, and you are one of the co-authors alongside with dear friends of persuasion, like David French and Thomas Chatterton Williams, as well as some people who are not particular friends of persuasion like Jason Stanley, um, often <laughs> op-ed in the New York Times, uh, uh, criticizing the banning of the teaching of critical race theory in many state legislatures. Um, tell me first of all, you know, how should we think about critical race theory and why is it something that does in fact concern you? Well, it, it's, I I'm, I'm appreciate you asking. And yeah, the, the past week has actually been quite interesting having recently authored, co-authored this piece with a bunch of people that have very different perspectives on the world in general um, and on, a, on any number of issues we could disagree with one another sharply but generally we all have like good relationships with one another that are pretty respectful um, both like in real life as we say and online uh, despite the fact that we can have sharp difference agreements with perhaps other people who are not cut from very different cloths from some of our collaborators but on this particular issue I think we all had some concern about the approach that people are taking to address what has become kind of a central issue in America's like ongoing, it seems, and ever evolving culture war. Uh, and I do think there's kind of one culture war that's been happening and just a bunch of different issues that kind of slot in for the major point of contention. And this, this month or the past couple of months, it's been critical race theory which I think is kind of the first problem. I mean, we know uh, the, the, the distinction that, you know, someone like, um, uh, I'm forgetting her name now. He just, Chris was, Chris Rufo was just on her show with her. Oh, Joy Reid um, might talk about critical race theory and say, oh, you know, that's just something they talk about in law school. Um, but as it happens in the culture now, critical race theory, like alt-right or any number of other phrases, like has now come to mean a bunch of different things, like a universe of different concepts. They're all loosely associated with like racial essentialism. And in the current debate, there are questions about the degree to which these things ought to be involved in K through 12 education and the ways in which they can be involved in K through 12 education. And unfortunately, rather than just having a conversation publicly about, you know, how we ought to be approaching education and what, what can be important, what can be included there. Um, this has become a circumstance where there are, have been some people, some activists, I think, who have been kind of advancing critical race theory in different ways. Again, whatever that basket of things is, in classrooms and sometimes in ways that have been disturbing and concerning to some parents. And the response uh, on, the, on the right largely, but not exclusively has been, well, we're going to ban critical race theory, which once you get into the, to the process of, kind of outright bans on ideas, not you know, methodology, not pedagogy so much, but, but on ideas, um, this becomes just a really thorny issue um, and, you know, K through 12, there's obviously a lot of autonomy that states have to make determinations about what can be included in curriculum and what can't from a legal standpoint. But the, the Times opinion piece that we authored together was really about the principle. 
Like we live in a society where we have very different values. And to the extent we have this project of public education that we are all corporately funding, then we have to have very serious conversations about what that institution is supposed to be doing, what its values are, and how we adjudicate like actual disputes about what is true and what is the best way to talk about our history and what is the best way to kind of deal with issues related to identity um, and how do we address genuine concerns and actual abuses when it comes to say racial discrimination or any number of other things that may cause students discomfort in an environment where they're necessarily going to be confronted with difficult challenging topics so um perhaps let's get away a little bit from the term of critical race theory because at least in the way in which the debate has played out over the last weeks or months it's frankly been silly season with even uh, supposedly serious uh, writers and intellectuals just making i think very strategic very partisan arguments about what is or isn't critical race theory yep. just to serve uh you know whatever the, the the point seems to be at any one moment um when we focus on what's actually being taught in k-12 education um how is that changing? What about is this good? And what about it should we be worrying about when it comes to topics like race in the United States? Yeah, I mean, it's like almost any a universe of other things that have happened, you know, since over the last 13 months where this quote unquote racial reckoning has taken place and race has become a center point for so many different conversations where we're kind of reframing every aspect of American life and the various conflicts that we've been having forever and different considerations, our sense of uh, the, the country's place in history, our sense of our individual responsibility to one another, we're framing it all with respect to race. It only makes sense that in the context of public education, the same thing is beginning to happen. And I think there's a sense in which it is good to scrutinize these, these concepts, these ideas that we, we kind of, they're, they're a part of our milieu and they're often a part of the, our relationships with one another in the world and our institutions. Um, but I don't think that the conversations we've been having about race uh, become more sophisticated as a result. I think there's kind of this veneer of sophistication. Um, we don't challenge the, the kind of ideology of race. We, we assume it to be true. Uh, and there are a great many different kind of essentialist threads that have been kind of woven into the fabric of our conversations about these things, the inherent disadvantage of Black people, the kind of necessary, quote unquote, racist proclivities of white people, and a flattening of the world when it comes to outcomes um, that is now pervasive in terms of beliefs about outcomes that when there are disparities in outcomes, that all of those disparities are necessarily by definition racist, like essentially a, a changing of the definition of the word. Um, and what's important is that we've kind of changed the way that we use it in a practical, con practical way, but we haven't like taken away any of the sting of racist being primarily attached to people and things that are kind of actively um, harmful or derogatory. Uh, with respect to someone's opinions or perspectives on an issue. And, and I think that that's created no shortage of problems in virtually every context. And in the context of kind of public education, it's certainly no different. You, you, you mentioned the term essentialism, which I think is important in this context. I mean, one of the strange things that has happened is that when you look at some of the uh, academic and intellectual origins of what people now are calling critical race theory, there's an emphasis on strategic essentialism mm -hmm. uh, by people like uh, Gayati Spivak, uh, who say, look, um, you know, race is a social construct and all of these identities aren't real in any biological or other sense, but in a society in which some people are victimized on the basis of a perceived identity, it makes sense for them strategically to rally around that kind of banner and fight back. And I think that there's, there's something convincing to that, Spivak herself has disclaimed the term because of the way it started being used in part in, in, in India by, by, by Hindu nationalists. So there's an mm -hmm, interesting mm -hmm. story there. Um, but I guess what I most worry about when it comes to something like K-12 education is the way in which the strategic element of a strategic essentialism has dropped out. And there is now often just essentialism with a capital E. Um, the thing mm -hmm. that just most shocks me, which I think is more prevalent in private schools than public schools, is these imposed racial affinity groups, which is not 14, 15 year old students saying, hey, I wanna be part of the African-American club. I wanna be part of a whatever club. That's freedom of association. It is teachers telling sometimes 10 or nine or 11 year olds, hey, 
you're Asian, you're Latino, you're black. You got to go yes. over in this group or in that group or in that group. And then we'll talk yeah. to you as a group. Um, tell us sort of, I, I know you uh, are a strong critic of essentialism and a strong critic of, of race as a concept in a way. How should we be thinking about the real way in which race structures our social relations, but without rarefying a concept that, that can be very harmful? Right. I mean, for me, I think it's about engaging with the, the genuine complexity of the world and the genuine complexity of, of our histor the historical circumstances that we, we come out of that brings us into the present context. And I think, unfortunately, rather than, again, engaging with that complexity, it's, well, it's very convenient to allow ourselves to get to slip into this thinking where, well, it's just about the primacy of race. Like race has been kind of the, the force that has been principle with respect to oppression and repression and disadvantage in this country. So we'll talk about things in that way, primarily from, from now on for the rest of time. Um, and the reality is that it's, it's always race and, and acknowledging that reality and engaging with that complexity rather than allowing ourselves to slip into a sensibility where, you know, all, all privilege is kind of derived in this fundamental mental hierarchical way. And if you are, you know, in the intersectional sense, like woman plus uh, your sexuality is one thing, you know, plus your race is another thing, then that gives us a sense of your, your kind of disadvantage score. Um, and and I, I just think that that is, it's obviously fraught to go about trying to understand the world in that way. You necessarily lose a lot of the nuance that's really important for, for understanding things. And I think in the context of education in particular, when you're dealing with, with kids, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about, you know, just the, the notion of education more broadly, like what is that project about? It seems to me that it's about helping young people be able to kind of discover the world and make sense out of it not merely kind of transmitting our beliefs from one generation to another, giving them kind of an approved, um, approved catalog of things that we know to be true, but really allowing them to kind of get particular tools about, about art, about culture, about science, so that they can probe those different subjects. And I think race is kind of another social concept that we ought to be probing and asking serious questions about what does this mean to who we are? How does it work out? How does it um, how does it inform our understanding of different contexts and different different circumstances? And I think it's it's interesting that that's kind of what a project like the 1619 project is supposed to do. Um, but unfortunately, it only gives you kind of one one lens on that. And as a result, I think it loses a lot of the important details that complicate that story and make it even more fascinating and interesting, like all of those stories. Um, so, the, the sensibility that I have is to view race as one thing among many things that are important historically and give us a sensibility about what is actually happening in the real world today um, and allowing ourselves the ability to engage with those things in substantive and critical ways. Um, and I mean, sort of critical in the broadest sense of the word there, not, not in any sort of, you know, we're, we're tearing this down and breaking it down but we're, we're tearing it down and breaking it down for the purpose of understanding how it works and what it means and why it might be valuable, harmful, disadvantageous in different circumstances, depending on what our goals are. Um, so you were mostly talking about how we should think of race today in analytical terms um, and how it does or doesn't shape our society at the moment. I guess another way of getting at a similar question is to think about what we should hope the role of race to be uh, in 50 or 100 or 200 years in the United States or in other democracies around the world. Um, it seems to me that there's broadly uh, four positions, um, two that are on the very essentialist end. So there's mm -hmm. the ethno-nationalist or the white nationalist position um, that race is real and it'll always be there um, and, uh, you know, societies will thrive in so far as the supposedly superior group manages to stay in charge. That's obviously <laughs> something that neither of us has any sympathy for. Um, yes, I would uh, say I so. I think there's a second position that's actually in some ways structurally surprisingly similar, which is that race is so essential mm -hmm. and is so deeply baked in that it'll always uh, define uh, communities and societies. And rather than having a liberal democracy in which uh, we primarily are seen as uh, individual citizens with the same rights and duties, 
we should primarily be seen as members of our racial or perhaps religious communities. So that is right. our prime identification and that will always be uh, the case. Um, mm -hmm. That tends to have a more left-wing valence, but I think it shares some ontological commitments as it were. Mm -hmm. um, I think neither of us has much sympathy for that position either. Right. Um, I, I wanna hear where you fall between the third and the fourth. So I think the third position is something like, um, you know, humans are deeply tribal creatures. And so uh, questions like race, religion, deeply structure society, and they likely will for a long time. Um, but the project of institutions is to push against that, to allow us to have solidarity with each other, to allow us to maintain a complicated project like the United States of America that is a multi-ethnic, multiracial democracy. And so, yes, we need to recognize these groups um, and the fact that they'll never go away, but we need our institutions uh, to some extent to push against them precisely so we don't end up with one of the first two scenarios, neither of which is, is, is attractive. Um, I think a fourth position is even more sanguine about the possibility of pushing back against groups and saying, no, actually, ideally, we should aim for an America 50 or 100 years from now, where people really don't, in any uh, big significant sense, think of themselves as a member, certainly of an ethnic or racial group, uh, perhaps not even in sort of a religious group, but that's a slightly different question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about options three and options four? Or would you put it differently? Do you think I've cut up the space in the wrong way? No, I, I think that's the that's a fabulous um, delineation. And I, I, I especially uh, value the way that you talked about the first two categories together, which is essentially like the racist and anti-racist paradigm. And the, the important thing, the unifying concept there is the primacy of race. Like that is the, the most important thing about our experience um, or among the most important things about our experience. And, and yes, I reject it wholesale because it's, it's obviously false. Um, and I think the third one is, is interesting. And I think it does pay attention to the reality that people do have a natural proclivity to sort of gravitate towards those differences, the delineations that they, they're able to detect that, that we're kind of innately tribal in some sense. Um, and that perhaps this will always be with us. Um, I, the the difficulty I have with that is it's a bit there's a bit of the kind of naturalistic fallacy like that's that's in operation there. It's kind of it'll always be there, so we can kind of get used to it. And there's a sense in which like you know we you have a child. My 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 daughter yesterday slapped me in the face and kicked me. She's she's three. Um, I have an expectation that these things will happen. Like we have violent urges from time to time, and you know one of the great things that we've accomplished as a civilization is developing the capacity to cooperate with one another, to see one another in, in ways that are more than sort of either advantage, potential things to be used to our advantage so we can attain some ends or obstacles to the ends that we want to attain. And sometimes my daughter doesn't see me as more than either of those two things. And developing the skills, the, the developing the restraint necessary, all of the things that we need, the acculturation to you know, the, the three kind of liberal traditions that Jonathan Rauch talks about in his new book um, and in terms of, you know, both economics and our social order and in terms of our ability to sort of grok what is true about the world. Um, and the Constitution of, of Truth is like just it's great Constitution of Knowledge is a great book if folks haven't read it um, for those insights in particular. Um, I think we have to have like kind of aspirational values. Um, and I think only the fourth one really contains that. And the fourth one that you just laid out is about kind of viewing, viewing one and granting one another the, the dignity of our individuality. And I think only a, 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 an aspiration towards a world where we are regarding race in precisely the same sort of way that we regard height you know, <laughs> or eye color or hair color, perhaps more precisely, because you can change your eye color and hair color. Uh, with some with some with some assistance and no one comes to think oh no now you're a totally different person you're blue you're you're blue today this is remarkable um and it's not colorblindness as an aspiration i've i've always thought that colorblindness didn't quite go far enough um also colorblindness sounds like a defect like we're trying to ignore something which i think is very different than recognizing racecraft for what it is um, which means appreciating the ways that it's sort of changed us and, alt and altered us and altered the way that we thought about the world and had an impact on people's actions and the aspiration to move towards a world where we recognize those kind of 
phenotypic traits for what they are um, and the degree to which they may kind of correlate with certain kinds of outcomes and patterns and social realities that we have to, to exist alongside. But we understand that, that they can be completely meaningless, that, that in many instances, that when we add race to the conversation, we're obfuscating things that are actually true about the world as opposed to actually illuminating things. And various thinkers have a very difficult time like actually getting to the point where they can make that recognition. It's the, it's what leads you to, you know, a, a world where Ibram Kendi becomes a leading thinker and intellectual by giving you all sorts of clumsy solipsisms and um, like circular logic as bold insights where he can say vacuous things like racism and capitalism are twins, you know, they're both, they need to be separated and they can't be separate. If you love capitalism, you love racism. It's insane. <laughs> but but he's, you know, celebrated. So we, we have to, the fourth is the only option for me, for sure. But that's interesting. Tell me a little bit more about your skepticism towards the idea of color blindness. Um, I, I quite like the distinction that I believe Tom Awalada drew in the pages of persuasion between race blindness and racism blindness. He says that the critics of something like uh, color blindness want to say, well, you just want to blind yourself to the existing realities of racial discrimination. And he says, well, the answer to that is to say, we shouldn't be racism blind. We shouldn't be blind to the way in which racism deeply shapes society. Mm -hmm. um, but by and large, we should be race blind in how we ourselves act, which is to say that we shouldn't make um, how people are treated, especially by the state in various circumstances, depend on uh, the color of their skin. Um, it seems to me like you find that still insufficient, but there's a third thing we need to do, which is to actually uh, try to, to reduce the way in which race even determines our mental categories. Um, mm -hmm. Explain to me what sort of, how you would go beyond, beyond this race, racism blindness distinction mm -hmm. um, and how we do that without becoming racism blind. Yeah, well, I, I think there's no, there's no obvious reason why we need to, well, there's two things. One, I think there's just kind of aesthetics here. Like there's a sense in which like anti-racist like offends me because I don't know what you're in favor of. And in much the same way, kind of race blindness, color blindness. Well, in, in the real world, if we were talking about color blindness, like this is a deficiency of yours, like you're unable to do something. And that just seems strange to me. So I know that what I want is a world where we're talking about you know equality under the law and a genuine sense of respecting the dignity of people's individuality and there's a sense in which race is conceptually just does not actually allow us to do that it's an obstacle to that project um so i i would prefer for us to to better define our terms in that respect um but i don't know that i disagree with the sentiment that it's important to be aware of racism but i don't have to or to be aware of racism or to be aware of, you know, the effects of race historically and how it may correspond to people's outcomes today. Um, but I don't, I don't think that one needs to sort of have a, a, a kind of willful or deliberate or kind of learned race blindness um, it, it, alongside kind of a conception of the ways that kind of disparities have injured people. And maybe I can illustrate it in this way. I have, I have a friend, for example, who is a government contractor and he has an 8A certification because, you know, for African-Americans, you get sort of preferential treatment uh, in, in um, contracting. I wonder if I should tell this story. I'm doing it anyways. And, and he happens to be, you know, first generation American. He's Ghanaian. And there's something perverse and absurd about a system that allows a guy who is very, very bright to leverage a system that was built for the, the descendants of, of sort of disadvantaged persons, slaves, to be able to get a leg up in today's society. Well, his family, his ancestors were capturing and perhaps selling slaves into slavery. He immigrates here, is among the brightest people in the country, most advantaged, and is taking advantage of a program that is supposed to help the descendants who he helped to, his ancestors kind of helped to deprive. Like it's, it's an obvious absurdity and people pat themselves on the back about this, you know, and, and the, the, the move that we've made in recent months is not to better understand the various ways in which this concept is convoluted and confuses things. It's to capitalize B and black in the New York times.
and to imagine that by by further emphasizing these concepts by by further in, in, in grace, by further committing ourselves to the pernicious fiction of the the idea the ideology of race we can kind of liberate ourselves from something um i think that you know race blindness for a while uh, seemed to be the kind of prevailing ideal in this country but because we weren't trying to liberate ourselves from you know race craft from race as an ideology I, I i think it kind of set a bit of a trap for us it allowed us to slip back into this this fixation um, with this idea and i think it's it's very it's very frustrating and disappointing um and in the worst forms it's probably a bit dangerous um you said something on twitter recently which uh resonated a lot of terrible things there sometimes get myself into <laughs> trouble i'm sorry no no this is something that resonated with me um uh it was basically to say that so many people aren't driven by their own substantive beliefs don't look at a particular political controversy in light of their values and try to think how the values should inform a response to it they simply look at what people they dislike say and try to say the opposite um, yeah um how you know describe that phenomenon how you see it playing out in the public debate but uh, tell us how you as somebody uh, who's a committed libertarian um uh try not to do that yourself how is it that you look to your guiding principles um uh in a way uh that that hopefully allows you to fall into the trap of of, of what i had the suggestion of amelie um, office started to call 180ism mm -hmm. 180ism is a great term for that um i'll, I'll start by saying and, and we kind of talked about this briefly before but you know after writing the times editorial i got like some interesting feedback like very intense feedback in a couple of instances received text messages from friends who felt like deeply betrayed and, and who were you know outraged that I would do this and I've had to kind of tick through like what the reasons are because my perspectives haven't changed um, in many instances we kind of interact with one another privately and I've shared my perspective on these issues and in other instances I've talked about these things publicly but in this particular case I'm kind of doing it alongside other people and perhaps doing it a bit too successfully in the sense that it, it kind of causes some genuine headwinds kind of winning the argument sort of way um so I can understand that but I've also noticed that there are kind of three things that happened beyond the occasions where I'm getting some sort of you know substantive like interesting critical feedback like arguments that I think make me make me genuinely reconsider my position and wonder if there isn't specific ways in which you know the other other side of this might be right but but beyond that it's guilt by association <laughs> it's um folks kind of misleadingly interpreting interp interpreting things in a way that i think is like misguided it's a misreading and sometimes those things are kind of willful and deliberate and other times they're very understanding um and those deliberate readings i'd say are just misinterpretations um that that I think veer into like being misrepresentations and some of them seem like pretty deliberate, maybe even strategic and kind of a Bannonite sort of way where you're flooding the zone with shit. You're, you're publishing, you know, a screed, a tirade against this piece, this editorial insisting that there's a defect in the way that it interpreted a law, which means that you can't trust this thing in the hopes of making certain people don't read it. And um, I think all of that is just kind of a reflection of this like weird hyper polarization that has been happening increasingly, um, which I think you know, polarization probably doesn't even go far enough. I think you you and I both talked to Martin Gurry about this, and I'm very I'm kind of partial to his um, observations about kind of the, the decline of like our ability to kind of trust in institutions. And as a result, I think people have kind of found something to their ideological commitments, their commitments to particular partisan factions um, as has been reinforced and has kind of replaced some of the other mechanisms that they might have used to determine what's true and not. And as a result of that, you know, policing the boundaries of your group and enforcing these kind of senses of loyalty has become really indispensable to people. And as a result, I think that creates some real problems. And interestingly for me, being someone who has, you know, heterodox politics, I certainly describe myself as a libertarian, um, probably anarcho-capitalist in other contexts. Spoonerite um, is another thing for anyone who knows who Lysander Spooner is. Um, but 
it's one of those things where the, the, that tribe is sufficiently kind of small and diverse that I don't have kind of the same tribal loyalties that kind of motivate me to, to kind of rush to defend a position on behalf of my team. I have friendships and partnerships with people and associations like across the political landscape. And we disagree vehemently on a ton of stuff. And as a result, I, I think that there's kind of a necessary bit of pragmatism that kind of comes to the forefront of like all of my thinking about different political issues. Like I know that I have very good, smart people who disagree with me forcefully on virtually everything. And as a result, um, naturally curious person that I am, I'm always trying to understand their point of view <laughs> and that commitment to trying to understand this very smart person's disagreement with me um, in sharp disagreement with me, it makes it very difficult, I think, to, to, to lurch into the, the kind of like deliberate presumption that someone is operating in bad faith or that they're, they're kind of making things up or that they're, they're just stupid. Uh, because they disagree with me. And it's possible that, that someone does all of the, the disagreeing with me for all those bad reasons. Um, but I think being aware of the fact that it's possible that I'm wrong in virtually every circumstance like, is, is enough of a break, at least for me to avoid the, the same trap. Yeah, I think there's something very telling about this political moment where uh, you know, people always describe uh, anybody whose positions they dislike and who gets a little bit of attention as a grift mm -hmm. um there seems to be <laughs> you know an inability it all goes to, to motive. think yeah yeah it, there seems to be an inability to think that people can be smart and good and have a different position than you right mm -hmm. like they can be smart and good and have the same position as you yes or they can be smart and have a different position and be a bad person right or they can be stupid and perhaps a good person have a different position than you but the three things together it's a sort of classic trilemma, I suppose. Um, uh, what do you think about the way in which in the current discourse that pressure is, uh, I think sometimes especially strong uh, for black writers or for Asian or Latino writers when sort of uh, there's this idea that who you are by terms of identity should determine how you see the world. And it's a mm -hmm. view that political elites in the United States seem to hold on to even as reality keeps telling them that is not the case. I was not just struck by uh, the mayoral election in New York City, which was won by Eric Adams, mm. um, a former cop who made his name by being very critical of police misconduct and police violence, but who also insisted that New Yorkers need good cops on the street and as many cops on the street rather than fewer cops on the street. I was even more struck by an article in the New York Times uh, in the days after his election uh, which said, oh my God, you know, it's so strange that progressives have trouble <laughs> winning over voters of color. I mean, what yes. could possibly explain that? And it made it sound like this is the first time that anybody had asked this question or that possibility had been raised, even for yeah. Joe Biden won on the support of African-Americans, even for polls showed that a huge majority of African-Americans and other groups rejected ideas like defund the police. Um, you know, describe a little bit what that sort of in-group pressure is like and 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 and, and how we can go against it, I mean, within communities, but also how we can disabuse, you know, frankly, white liberal journalists at places like the New York Times from mm -hmm. the notion that, you know, a black intellectual uh, has to be somebody who agrees with Ibram Kendi rather than somebody who agrees with uh, Camille Foster or Thomas Chatterton Williams or any number of other uh, writers and thinkers. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, we've seen this dynamic before. I mean, this is the that old that old trope. What's the matter with Kansas? And in this particular case, it's what's the matter with Brooklyn? It's the same sort of thing. Like these people don't know what's good for them. They're voting against their own interest, and and I think there there's like a pair of problems there. I mean, one is the the ideological presumptions or ideologically driven presumptions about what is imagined to be best for a collection of people in a particular area by some elites who, who you know, have, they have their opinion. Um, and then the, the second thing is what we've been talking about all along here, just the, the essentialist um, aspect of it and presumptions based on the, char the characteristics of those individuals. Um, and you know, there's, there's the fact of, of people who self-identify as black voting in a particular way um, over time. And then there's the reality of the, the many distinct reasons why they choose to vote in those ways and the degree to which, you know, having a, a two-party system 
kind of creates these kind of this sense of like false cohesion um, and uh, a sense that these people are kind of their senses and their beliefs and convictions are easily discernible. Um, that's just wrong. <laughs> it just is, is factually inaccurate. Um, it, as for my own personal experience, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I'm a first generation American as well. Uh, my family is from Jamaica. I happen to be born in the country. Um, and as a result, I've always had uh, a tension between kind of the notion of blackness as I thought of myself, you know, as a black person for, for many, many years before reaching the epiphany that I, I reached at some point to disregard all that kind of racial nonsense personally. Um, but I always had a tension between black as kind of like African-American and black as, you know, Jamaican. Um, and as time gone on, I went to even further to have this real kind of tension between like any kind of enforced rigid identity that's imposed on me versus an identity that's kind of born out of things that are actually relevant and say something about my my life and my experience and um, necessarily true about my life and experience like i'm a i'm a father and i'm a husband like these are these are things that are literally true i'm an entrepreneur literally true i mean i'm a libertarian these are my actual beliefs to say i am black like what on earth does that mean even to say I'm Jamaican, it's kind of like, well, not nationality wise, but like, yeah, some of my ancestry comes from there. Like, these are very crude concepts that we often treat in a very serious way. Um, and again, that is the kind of lack of serious scrutiny that we're actually attributing to these things that we've given so much power and prominence in our society. We, we imagine we're being sophisticated when we talk about criminal justice and criminal justice reform and structural racism. Um, and we forget that just like race, I mean, this is just, you know, our instinct to categorize things. We've done absolutely nothing when we re recast a, a reality that we discover in the world. You know, these, these racial disparities that may even be like repeating patterns as systemic racism and imagine that we've you know arrived at some kind of eureka moment and you've all your work is still ahead of you to quote uh christopher hitchens um so you pointed out that it's a mistake to ascribe all differences and outcome between groups uh to racism um and i think when you look around the world there's good indication that you have uh, different outcomes between all kinds of groups uh, in countries from uh, Germany to Japan to Malaysia and, and, and you could go on. Um, at the same time, it's obviously true, uh, I think in the context of the United States, that particularly when you look at the group of descendants of slaves, um, mm -hmm. uh, as you're pointing out, often actually black immigrants to the United States and the descendants are very successful. But when you look at the descendants of slaves, uh, they do suffer real disadvantages as a group. And, uh, you know, it has obvious historical reasons uh, that are rooted in, in deep and abiding injustices. Um, how mm -hmm. should we balance uh, the recognition that not every difference of outcome by group is in itself pernicious uh, with the awareness that in the American case, uh, one of the reasons why a large portion of the black population of the United States continues to be less well off and have less wealth is rooted in the history of slavery and, 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 and that injustice. Um, and what does that mean for what kind of government policies we should adopt, uh, what kind of social norms and morals we should adapt, uh, how we can hope to overcome what I sometimes call the sort of long shadow of past domination uh, mm -hmm. without rarefying race in all the ways uh, that I agree with you would be quite harmful. Yeah. Well, well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I have a number of different thoughts about this, um, and I'm actually interested in yours um, because you know, to begin, I think there's a sense in which I don't have any, any desire to kind of prioritize suffering on the basis of you know, how it was arrived at. Uh, I don't, it, to the extent you are a child who lives in, in an impoverished household and you lack resources and you have only access to a crappy school, it doesn't matter to me if I'm describing a kid who lives in East New York or Appalachia like the concern is equivalent. Like these are fellow human beings who are suffering. This is a, a societal problem that needs to be addressed. And the fact that a greater proportion of black young people find themselves in that circumstance than the proportion of white people that find themselves in that circumstance, I think there's something obscene 
about presuming that this is kind of more or less important to, to, to kind of address the disparity between the racial groups and not regard those children as individual and to think collectively about how we can like address really hard social problems. And for that reason, I'm, my fixation is on the problems themselves and what we can do technically to address them. And it's, it's a sense in which, of course, it matters why a car accident happens, you know, um, but obsessing over that to the, to, to the detriment of our ability to actually address the injuries of the parties involved in the car accident, where you're not even loading up the, the, the injured people onto gurneys and getting them into ambulances and getting them off to the hospital is just, it, it, it gets me a little worked up. I mean, it's, it's beyond dispiriting, which I think is what we're doing precisely with this like critical race theory debate. I think it is insane that in a country where we have so many underperforming schools in cities like LA, New York, Atlanta, like the greatest cities in America, we have schools that systems that are failing in some instances, more than half of the students that go to them. They can't teach them to read or do mathematics. And instead of talking about that issue, that very hard problem, we are obsessing over whether or not we're talking about you know, the, the Tulsa race massacre in school. Well, I imagine most of these kids don't know anything about Bacon's rebellion either. Is that a function of us trying to hide the truth from them and obscure facts? Or is it a function of like something else that is actually gravely wrong with our educational system? And are we actually able to marshal the resources and the will to address those fundamental difficult problems as opposed to engaging in this preposterous theater where one of the largest teachers unions in America brings in Ibram X. Kendi to talk to them about racism, to, to spit these baseless tropes um, about the, the idea that any racial disparity is necessarily racist. And that alone, you know, we, we're anti-racist, we have to fix the disparities. It's obscene. This is a Harrison Bergeron style worldview. Um, and I'm astonished that it is achieved the kind of dominance that it has amongst elite intellectuals and amongst elite culture in this country. It is, it's actually kind of, it's, it's kind of frightening in some respects, because if they can embrace such an impoverished um, and frankly dangerous idea like that, like what other corruption are they capable of embracing? And this is to the detriment of children. And it allows the teachers unions to, and other factions, to try and impose this crap through the schools and the response from people angry about this for the most part is well, we have to ban critical race theories and get our schools back. They weren't working before. They were broken. This is an inadequate solution. And it's certainly an inadequate solution to insist that what we need are bans on particular bad ideas that in no universe in the world will be able to pass in most of the states where these things are perhaps the most ridiculous, where there are the most obscene and egregious iterations of quote unquote critical race theory, bad ideas, you can't pass these ridiculous bans. You cannot, this will not fix the problem. I think I saw someone on Twitter say, and it really resonated with me that, you know, laws don't make you safe. And it's true, you know, they, they create criminals. They don't make you safe. I think for anyone who is a proponent of these bands, um, to bring it back around to that topic, I feel like I'm doing a lot of, of monologuing today. I'm sorry, Yasha. Um, it's very but... interesting monologuing, and, and, and that's <laughs> a part of having you on. <laughs> but for anyone who's a proponent of these bands, like the, the challenge that I have for you is like, how many pink slips do you have? How many, how many you know, handcuffs or whatever else do you have? How many teachers are you willing to kind of frog march out of these buildings for saying things that you deem inappropriate? How many show trials are you willing to have to adjudicate whether or not a professor, a teacher who insists that a student should read, say, Ta-Nehisi Coates or James Baldwin for that, that matter, who have scathing things to say about America and in cases where you don't necessarily give them you know, a competing view like, should people be fired over that sort of thing? I imagine that's not the world that we want to live in, but trying to adjudicate this on kind of an issue by issue basis, like one problematic book at a time, I think ignores the fact that there is a genuine cultural defect and you cannot drive out that cultural defect that makes us obsess over race in the way that we do. This obviously unhelpful and counterproductive way that we do, you can't drive that out by making things illegal. You actually have to address it. You have How to address the culture, I'm saying. 
yeah, that, that, that seems right. I mean, speaking of a culture, how optimistic or pessimistic are you about where America is going? I always find myself torn between being very <laughs> pessimistic about everything on the level of <laughs> politics and media and increasingly what's taught in schools, how universities are run. Um, I'm also relatively optimistic about the actual life of Americans. When you look at all kinds of indicators, um, uh, you know, progress is not as fast as we might wish, but there's a lot more intercultural, interreligious, interracial friendships, marriages. Um, there's a lot more people founding businesses together, really uh, being in each other's lives in a real way. And of course, all the indicators of public opinion about uh, the attitudes towards each other are improving as well. Um, you know, do you think that this is uh, sort of the last kick of uh, a society that was founded on race and we're trying to see everything through a racial lens and perhaps in 50 years that'll all look quite antiquated and we'll have moved more towards what you call option four? Or do you think that, uh, you know, the way in which uh, both political forces uh, and some institutions are now trying to actually drive home the importance of race, including, of course, on the ethno-nationalist right, um, that that's going to win um, and, and, and sort of uh, preserve racecraft for another generation or, or many more generations of Americans. What's the outlook in your mind? Yeah, um, you know, I, I have to be optimistic. Um, I, I think for, for, the, for, the, for the reasons that you indicated, I mean, when I think about, you know, the, the enormous progress that we've made as a species, um, the fact that we've spent so much, much of our history collectively, you know, at war with ourselves, profound disadvantage to ourselves, not collaborating, not innovating, not building things. And we just had this incredible explosion of innovation in very recent years, really. Um, and, exp exp and because of our ability to cooperate, to truck barter and exchange. Um, and, you know, for that reason, I have to be a bit optimistic about our ability to continue in that vein. And I think it is incumbent upon us to be like profoundly aspirational in that respect and to really talk about the world that we want to live in and the terms that, that, that actually capture our ambition, um, as opposed to, you know, limiting ourselves to thinking about what seems achievable. I mean, the reality is that when you think about the, the horrible conditions of, you know, revolutionary America, the, the, the profound disadvantages that were placed on people who didn't own property, who had the wrong gender, who had the wrong skin color, who came from the wrong fam family backgrounds, who didn't have access to the profound you know, aspirational vision that is outlined in the founding documents of this country. Like, there's a way to look at that and imagine, oh, that's really sad. Like, it's sad that this country didn't live up to its, its promise at that point in time and hasn't lived up to its promise throughout most of its history. But looked at in the right light, it's like profoundly inspiring that out of the milieu of thousands, millennia of, you know, just subjugation and awfulness and superstition kind of dominating our, our species and keeping us down, like we, 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 there was an ideal that was born that took root and that has constantly and steadily been improving outcomes for us and making our lives better. And, you know, there's this James Baldwin quote that always comes to mind, which I haven't committed to memory yet. So I had to go look it up. So I don't want anyone to think I'm too smart, but um, I, I'm always, I always think about it and it starts out, uh, I know what I'm asking is impossible, but in our time as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand. And one is after all emboldened by the spectacle of human history in general and the American Negro history in particular, for it testifies to nothing less than the perpetual achievement of the impossible. And I mean, for, for me, like, I don't know how you can, how you can not want to do that. And for that reason, I can't not hope that we will rise to the occasion um, because the alternative is just, it's simply too bleak to even consider. You know, one of the things that I've started thinking about recently, and perhaps I'll, I'll ask you about that to, to round off a conversation, is that there's a lot of cynicism at the moment about, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of diverse democracies we can build. And a lot of that cynicism comes across as a kind of world wiseness right? It's a, look, you know, you want to move away from these groups being important. You want to have a society in which we emphasize the commonalities and the shared interests. 
between members of different groups. That's just not how the world works. We're always going to be divided into these groups. These groups deeply structure society to such an extent that you know everything, you know, Princeton is a racist and a white supremacist institution and so on, as its president said uh, last year. Um, and, uh, you know, therefore that's just the world to which we have to resign ourselves. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in history and comparative politics and social psychology uh, in writing my next book. And most of those societies in which people's loyalty was more strongly to their ethnic or religious group than to the state of a nation ended up in really violent forms of conflict over time. Mm. And so I wonder whether the thing that sort of comes across as worldwide um, and that sets itself up against naive people who want to emphasize uh, the need to go beyond uh, the primary association with, with groups in that way, uh, well, there's not actually them who are quite naive about how those societies will work out in the long run. And that's certainly how I think in the concrete example of these 10 year olds being split into affinity groups, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're thinking that these white kids who then form one of the affinity groups whom you're telling to feel bad about themselves and, um, you know, to engage in anti-racist activism uh, are going to become the super enlightened, self-abnegating people everything we know about groups throughout history is that it's much more likely that they'll say, well, if you're telling us the most important thing about us is that we're white, then let's identify as that and fight for our interests. That's how human groups usually work. So I guess my question is who's being naive here? And, <laughs> and is, there, is there a conflict between idealism and, 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 and the best chance to create a fair, diverse democracy um, or, or actually do those things go hand in hand? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, you're asking me a, a, a question that you already know the answer to. I mean, you loaded it up there. Like, I, I don't know how anyone can. Guilty as child. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how anyone can appreciate the, the degree to which their good intentions when they segregate children by race and tell them, tell one group of kids, you're, you're privileged and there's a problem with that and you need to do something about it. You need to work on your problems. And the other group of kids are encouraged to say, well, yeah, that's right. Also, I'm disadvantaged and there's so much wrong and everything is working against me. And you can't imagine that this will breed resentment and a lack of self-esteem and less empathy, not more. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a, it's bottomless, it's bottomless awfulness. <laughs> I, I can't, I have a very difficult time with that. And I, again, I know I have smart friends who disagree with me. And I, I want to understand their perspective, and I try to, um, but I think that they're profoundly wrong about this. And I think that anyone who, anyone who is concerned about racial issues and thinks that we need to say, place more emphasis on those things, I mean, the question I would put to them, the thing I would ask them to contemplate is what does it look like when we're doing too much of that? What are the drawbacks of over, of over concern with respect to these issues um, and respect to, with respect to you know, race and identity in, pop, in, in particular. And at the moment for the kind of ascendant ideas related to, to kind of racial equity and racial justice, et cetera, there doesn't seem to be any appreciation whatsoever for the degree to which there could be some sort of adverse unintended consequences related to this, this push beyond um, the, the sensibility that it will kind of create some sort of racial backlash and will fuel white racist ethno-nationalist um, violence, which um, again, I think there's, there's some naivete in that uh, and it's, it's profoundly counterproductive. Uh, and yeah, you just need to think a bit more clearly about what their project is um, and how best to help people. And perhaps it's appropriate to view people as people. Um, and not to, to imagine that, you know, focusing on original sin in the garden um, can actually help to liberate us today from the challenges that we actually face. Camille Foster, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Yasha. You, you bring out the best in me. I appreciate you.